everybody. I'm just gonna start adding our guests in. So please be patient with me. <laughs> Hello. Hi! Hi! Welcome! We're just waiting for Malise to get in. Do this! Hi, everybody! <laughs> Woo! Good morning! How are you? Where? Oh, good morning, <laughs> Chloe! <laughs> Hi, Diane. Oh, it says Malise is unable to join. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, technical difficulty. We're just adding Malise in. Hi, Alice. Hi, Diana. Yay, we got her. Hi, Malise. Hey, everyone. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Love Bonito's International Women's Day series of conversations where we discuss talk, and talk about perspectives related to different women's issues. We've been doing this for a few weeks now, and so if you are coming back again, welcome back. Um, in today's session, we're gonna be talking about gender uh, gender equality. I'm Rachel Kwan. Um, I'm a child and family development specialist, and I'm gonna be your moderator for today. Love Bonito, we're all in our beautiful Love Bonito outfits, and we all picked the same outfit because it's that awesome, guys. Love Bonito <laughs> same <is Asian>. color too. <laughs> Asia's leading fashion brand, where we believe in the power of community, and to us that means a group of like-minded, beautifully dressed women supporting, sharing, and growing with each other in this journey towards becoming the best versions of ourselves. This International Women's Day and every other day calls for the breaking free from expectations of womenhood and owning your perspective because your perspective matters. This week is all about women's rights and we'll be talking about gender equality. If you've missed our previous sessions, you can find them over on Love Bonito's YouTube channel using the link in the chat. Whew. So to kick it all off, <laughs> I am super excited to introduce our esteemed panelists. We have Malise Chan. Uh, Malise, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Hi, I'm Malise. I'm based in, in KL. Um, I am the founder of a brand called Bubble. So we are in the space of period care where we offer safer and also sustainable alternatives uh, for your period. Um, I'm also a mom of two, so I have a, a daughter, Alea, who's five, and a son, Asher, who's just turned one. Oh, I love that. Alea, Asher, and we love Bubble. Um, and, <laughs> and we also have Juanita. Juanita, tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, I am also in KL, Malaysia. I'm a radio DJ. Um, I do the morning show now on Fly FM with Douglas Lim. Um, funny yeah, guy. I've been <laughs> funny, super funny guy, really cool guy. Um, yeah, but yeah, I've been doing radio for ten years now. So quick, but yeah, <laughs> I'm I, I'm not a mom. I don't have any kids, but I have like ten nephews and nieces, which is it's not qualified me to be like a mom. So I have a lot of respect for. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. like. As a mom, like one of my favorite like things is having uh, like my daughter having like aunties that love on her because mm -hmm. they always like they bring such a different. I believe very very strongly like in the village, right? And that that, that like you, know, you mm -hmm. get to have these conversations with each other. And so with that, I'm going to jump right into um, our first question. And actually, it's for you, Juanita uh, and Elise too, but. I'm interested to see, you know, because he said you're not a mom, but you're, you know, you're in radio and you're doing all these amazing things. So in your opinion, what is one prejudice against your gender that you would like to change? This is a loaded question because I'm like, where, where do I start so many? But um, I think from from personal perspective with uh, the work that, that I go through, it's just a very male-dominated uh, workplace 
I only have one other female coworker that I work with. I think it's um not not uh, taken at our word or not taken seriously um, mm-hmm. that our opinions and our choices are not considered right. And I think this goes back to this savior complex that some men have you know that you make decisions for us <laughs> thinking that they're doing us a favor or that they're being nice but it's it's not nice right when our choices aren't considered so uh without getting into specific details it's something that has happened a couple of times at work where m- my choice wasn't considered you know when it came to making content about me and mm. you know these are conversations that i've had to have with my bosses to say, hey, this is what I need. Um, I need you to consider and to ask me first because sometimes maybe they don't know, right? That's just how they've functioned. But yeah, in this couple of times at work, I think the first one involved my personal life where they wanted to include like my boyfriend on the show. And I was like, I wasn't even asked about it. (laughs) Yeah. And then the second one involved me having to do a challenge. But and the more I think about it, the more I, I realize this, this would have never happened with my male partner. And thankfully, I have a really good, you know, male partner on the show. Douglas is awesome. And he also tells me like, hey, that's not cool. And he'll voice out and say that. So, yeah, I, th- I think very often, especially in the Asian culture, we're, we're taught to just smile and say, okay, you know, don't, don't be difficult. Don't argue back. It's rude. Um, but I think it's it's extremely important to first know what we need in that moment and then to ask for it. So yeah, that's that's one prejudice that I would personally get. I really, I really like what you say. You know, this idea of a lot of times at work, I'm not being taken seriously or my opinion isn't considered because there's mm-hmm. this, the man makes the decisions, right? The man the man gets to decide and. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting perspective. I also love how you said, but at the same time, you know, I'm not here necessarily to bash a man because alongside I have a coworker that stands up for me, that sees yeah. me, that says, hey, that's not cool. We should invite Juanita to the conversation. Thanks for sharing that, Juanita. What Thank about you. for you, Mali? Ah, uh, I mean, similar to Juanita, there are so many things out there. But if I had yeah. to pick two, um, I mean, obviously, there's just, there is a very clear and equal access to opportunity, whether it be it, you know, education, um, career um, opportunities for women to rise in their careers, especially if they personally decide to go into, you know, the next phase in their life, if they choose to have children, um, there's still a lack of support for women who want to take that career break um, without potentially her role um, or her value or her salary even being threatened if she wants to take that, that one April, you know, uh, 12 to 18 months off. Um, even medical support. Um, I, I had lunch with a friend recently and she shared this story about pain bias. Has anyone heard of pain bias before? Yes. yes. No. It's, it's quite crazy. I mean, correct me though, Rachel, right? So what I understood from her was that when it comes to clinical trials, it's mostly, well, men get selected for clinical trials because they don't want to run the risk that it affects uh, females' fertility or reproductive um, system. And so if after going through the clinical trials, if things been approved, gone to market, if a man and a woman had actually gone into the hospital with the same, um, I guess, symptoms uh, to whatever that particular illness is, a man would be prioritized to receive um, treatment for a woman because all the studies is actually based on a male's physiology and not a female's physiology. So I was just shocked to hear that. I think just in terms of health, health support, health care for women, there is a big gap. But that's why we're also at the same time now seeing a big rise with you know, femtech companies and innovations in the space of women's health to really support women because there's such a big gap. Um, and there are a lot of new technologies and new startups and businesses that are trying to disrupt this area and close this gap. So definitely, I just feel, yeah, across, you know, gender, sorry, education, um, career, uh, access to, to medical support um, for women, uh, that's, I still see that as a very big significant prejudice. And if I'm going to add another thing in terms of language, if you think about like the language that's been obviously like, you know, in the whole of English, the word men, man, he is kind of everywhere. Like in my industry, it's menstruation. And there's sort of like this men there, um, you know, mankind, 
uh, sportsmanship, you know, heroes. And now we're, already, you know, we're obviously trying to flip the conversation and say sheroes, but that's another thing. I see that there's a lot of <laughs> the, the, the male gender, that words sort of pop up in a lot of our general English language. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Cause you know, I just had this conversation with my daughter a few, yeah, a while ago, and we were talking about how when mama grew up, there was different names for like flight attendants, you know, or, or like they've changed the pronouns now to make it um, a lot more inclusive. So I think certainly, I think it's like you say, I think there's a lot more people having conversation about it, a lot more people trying yeah. to stand up. And I think this that you guys are here having this conversation with me, I think, um, opens up our, our world to something differently. Absolutely about the pain bias because mm -hmm. imagine, so I work with kids, so the pain bias between women and men and then the pain bias between little girls and little mm. boys are very different too because girls are taught to cry wolf, right? That like, oh, she's mm. just crying, that's normal. But if a, a little boy cries, then surely Mazin is more painful. But then at the same time also comes the conversation of boys don't cry or boys shouldn't mm -hmm. be allowed to cry. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I think again, sort of brings us to our next question, which is, you know, if we are talking in terms of, we want to have this conversation more, we want to be able to sort of, like you say, you know, in Femtech and people are, are, are bringing it up to the table, right? Putting it on the table. Then what do you think is your opinion on our education system? Because I think, like me, that's where it starts, right? The education system, we, we want to teach little kids and little 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 boys and little girls. And then even the employment situation in, you know, as they go out, as they, as they leave the school system and they go out to their workplaces, what do you think are some of the um, gender inequality issues in workplaces as well as in the education system? Um. Do you want to go first? I can go yes, first. Yes, just yes, sort of, yes. yeah, leading off, I guess, my last comment. I mean, just a quick yeah. one. Um, again, uh, specific to, to periods. And, and I asked the audience here, if you guys think about how much you actually learn about your periods in school, um, and it would probably be like 0.01% of that is the knowledge that a man may, may have. And that's just because boys aren't talk, talked about periods in school and, and why not? They're hustled out of the room and there's already sort of that bias and that separation there that all oh, periods is a woman's problem. Um, so I think that, you know, when it comes to anything um, health and sex related in schools and to start normalizing these conversations and breaking through the stigma and the shame that we face, especially since it's more complex uh, in an in a Asian country um, and obviously different religions in play, uh, we should have boys and girls learn about it equally. Um, mm. So that's the first thing. And then at the same time, especially in our B40 community, where uh, a lot of young girls are skipping school because they are having their periods. Um, and so goes the vicious cycle as they grow, as they grow up. Um, it also leads to potentially, uh, I guess, lesser opportunities when she's about to start her career as well. And likewise, again, B40 community, because young girls and women also don't know about periods much, don't have access to basic hygiene needs. They're, in fact, resorting to things like coconut husks or like uh, old rags and whatnot, um, you know, which could lead to, to, to underlying health conditions later. But what happens is then, again, there's just sort of this, there's just a lack of support um, in this mm -hmm. space. And uh, as she is about to or moving into her career, um, yeah, it's just uh, it's just sort of like a multiple years having been accumulated that has led into, I guess, um, the lack of equal, equal opportunity as she goes into building a career. Yeah, what I hear you saying, Melise, is this idea of, you know, in schools, if, if, if I think about it, first of all, I think we're not even taught enough about our bodies and periods. And, and it's really a hush conversation between little girls that, d that don't really know that heard it from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. And what if it was just in school where we taught it equally um, and, and properly and, and, and gave proper education, proper support, not just um, uh, um, from an education sense, uh, but also from from all the other all the other aspects. and. And, and that how it leads to then scaffold into their careers and, and what that might look like and, and how that affects the, the little girl that wasn't given the support now has to go into the world and might be having health implications that might be, you know, 
I couldn't really follow in school. Thanks for mm. sharing that. I love how you like kind of made that pathway. What about for you, Monica? Yeah. Um, I yeah. Well, for me, I I didn't like school at all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like going to school, and I went to school in uh, I think a bit more like I don't know the kampong, but yeah, it, I, but I got this a lot. I was um, the teacher would always comment about my appearance. You know, like you can't tie your hair, mm. like you can't tie half because you're trying to be sexy, or which is so weird to say to an eleven year old when you think about it. Mm. Um, you know, it's always that like you're you went to the toilet because you're trying to flirt with boys. Um, you know, in your budget room, you can see a little bit of lace, which is so normal because you have to wear an inner, right? And and they say you're trying to be sexy as well, and that would happen when I was like fourteen, fifteen. But this is what studies show, right? It shows that girls actually receive less attention from teachers, less needed attention from teachers. And girls have we hear more comments about our appearance than we do about our academic skills. Um, we receive less and lower quality feedback compared to boys. And I think structural change needs to happen. I think teachers need to be trained to handle these conversations properly, to be able to themselves identify individually when they are being biased because it's something that's very, I think, embedded in um, certain aspects of our culture, you know, especially one that allows for child marriage. Right. Um, mm. And I think that's on the Ministry of Education first and foremost to implement change. Um, I think it was also brought up in Parliament where they mentioned the Gender Equality Act. Um, this was I think, last year with the whole sexual assault and rape jokes at school came to light um, mm. by Ayin, right, who's advocating for it. Um, yeah, but it, I think it's also strange because I read more reports that said that enrollment of girls actually exceeds boys in middle and upper secondary and almost doubles um, at post-secondary and tertiary levels. So, yeah, it also showed that girls achieve better than boys. So, f from what I saw, it, it felt like it was more equal treatment of girls as opposed to equal opportunities, um, which leads me to, like, I think, equal opportunities that work. That's, that's what we don't have enough of, I think, in, um, in Malaysia and worldwide. Yeah, but yeah. You bring such a good point, this idea of, I love, like, I, I, like as soon as you said it, and then I, I sort of flash back to my, like, high school years and primary school years and and you know like all the different comments that your teachers would have on like I in that moment I remembered all the comments that the teachers would have on your appearance or like like it's the same thing where by Jukurong then you can see the inside and are you trying to be sexy or or like it was even like they had a say on like your hair and like the earrings that you wore and, and all these other different things mm -hmm. um that boys were not subjected to but mm -hmm. like the biggest thing that I, I, I sort of came home to was when you said, I think we need to then explore what are some of the biases that even the teacher has, even, you know, like to, before we can even talk about all those other layers, we need to sit down and say, okay, we're, like before the teacher can even show up in a certain space, the teacher needs to go explore what their biases are, which then really mm -hmm. makes you think about you know, how we're growing up and, and what our childhoods are and, and how we've been raised. Um, and, and something that struck me was that, you know, growing up very often in a lot of households, there are very specific chores that girls do and very specific chores that boys do um, from a certain era, from a certain... Um, I would even imagine that it happens now um, I don't know necessarily that if it's just Asian families or Asian culture, um, but I think definitely there seems to be this sort of bias between what the girls do at home and what the boys do at home. Um, what about for you? Did, did you grow up that way, uh, Mali? Uh, I was I was quite blessed. Um, so I come from a family of three girls. So I have two two sisters two younger sisters um, and yeah, my dad was always the solo guy at home. And I didn't really know or learn much about gender bias, especially um, at home until uh, well late into my 20s because um, 
growing up, my dad actually took a lot of the female roles. So my mom was always the one that had gone out to work and always worked for a company. Um, whereas my dad had done, you know, insurance and, and property and all these things. So it was never really, um, most of his career was never really, you know, working in a corporate company. Whereas my mom was, so she was a stable income, sort of uh, the breadwinner. Um, my mom cooks, but that's just because she's great at it. Um, dad, not so much. I think the only thing he could really cook is spaghetti bolognese. So sorry, dad, if you're watching this. But other than that, my dad took on everything else. He cleaned the house. He ironed all our clothes. He cleaned our school shoes. Um, and so I just never saw that there were specific roles between mom and dad because it's a woman or a man. So I, I was quite lucky that we grew up like that. And my dad is has been such a great example to really what I think that um, a, a man should be um, and just how and we were just very equal at home and even between my sisters and I also very very equal doesn't you know despite you know age or age difference so um, if anything I think I thought that was normal you know this is how my dad was so I thought it's normal um, obviously coming out and dating and all that it, it, it <laughs> To tarnish that perfect image of, of how you know how how men understand it should be at home. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I was just blessed that I grew up with a very unbiased um, sort of household. Yeah. yeah. How does that? I'm I'm just curious to see like how does that affect your household now? Does that translate into the same? way or, or I had to train my husband <laughs> uh, I'll be honest like when we started dating obviously there's there's you know some things that I taught and there's a certain standard and expectations but I also shared with him you know we, we are very much on the same page in terms of it's not just mom and dad it's very much about co-parenting at home and how we lead by example with our children because we would expect the same where um you know it's not that Asher my son would do certain things or Alea would do certain things. Um, there is just absolutely no belief about that between us. Um, but at the same time, we, we can't be hypocrites as well. So we, we've also got to lead by example. So dad has to help certain things and mom also does certain things as well. Um, I mean, I think certainly what I, what I, you know, when it comes to my dad, what I've learned from him, he's actually one of the cleanest people I have ever met. He's so clean. He will know how to get any stain out of any baju. Um, and like, yeah, he's really good at ironing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I hoped that my husband would be a bit more like that, but, uh, yeah, less so. But I mean, if anything, we do share the chores at home. It's just because we also want to set that example for our children. Yeah. I think it's that so powerful, this idea of, yeah, we want to be able to set it for our children and, and, and how that would impact then your children's children. What about mm. for you, Juanita? How did you grow up? Actually, very much like Melise, I was also very, very blessed. My dad did all the um, ironing. My mom <laughs> tried, but she would be like, we'll be very upset at it because it's like, what is this? And you just <laughs> iron. And she would just say like, you just ask your papa to do lah. You know? So there was a lot of that. Um, my dad used to like tie my hair to school and he was the only one that could do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, growing up, there, there wasn't much gender roles at home as well. My mom was out working a lot. She she taught at kindergarten in the morning and then she would work in you know, a double job, go and teach at another high school um, after that. But I think for me, the gender role that I had to break was that I could only do certain things if I was married. And I'm 30 and I'm single. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that was the gender role that I had to break. Not so much ho household chores, but it was like, I could only move out of my house and I could only live alone if I was married. I could only get a tattoo if I was married. So it was, it felt very strange because they were so encouraging with uh, my career, you know, and everything else that I wanted to do outside. And it was like, I had achieved a lot or like, I thought, you know, felt like a lot by the time I was 25, but still this, you know, you're getting older, you need to settle down, you need to have babies thing was a major limit to the person that I felt that I could become that I wanted to be. So these were the things that I had to break in my 20s, you know, this pressure, this made up societal construct that was like forced on me almost. So um, it contributed a lot to me thinking that I couldn't achieve things alone. And it took a lot of like internal work, I feel, to like um, to break out of being codependent as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it took a lot of change for me. I think individually to be independent, it's still work that I'm 
that I'm doing <laughs> and I'm working on. I think I think it's interesting how you said, you know, I had to sort of say, um, learn a different understanding of myself as a woman and how a woman moves in the world. Um, I like how you say, or well, not necessarily like, but you mentioned about how, you know, I couldn't get a tattoo uh, until I was married. I couldn't do all these things until I was married. Um, mm. And then on the flip side of that, a guy never has to do that, right? If a guy decides to get a tattoo, he doesn't have to wait till he is married or if a guy what was the other things that you had like it was um move out of the house the guy yeah just move out. wait until he's married to move out of the house so mm -hmm. his oats right um yeah <laughs> which yeah, then it, makes you also sorry go ahead no no please continue which then also you know sort of makes you think about I think for a long time as women, we've always sort of lived in a world and we, like almost felt as if we had to be more masculine in order to be taken seriously, more masculine in order to be um, like be respected more almost. And so there's this, what do you think about women in pantsuits? You know, it's said that pantsuits are a symbol of female empowerment and women in pants are perceived as more competent than those in skirts. Um, mm. I'll be very honest, as I read that, I, I was just like, what? <laughs> I'm a patient because <laughs> you can like, sit cross-legged. Um, but I think certainly there is a, a sort of almost notion that, you know, when women wear pants, they're seen as more competent more powerful you know there's a certain like what do they call it they're like a boss lady outfit right um mm. as a boss lady malice what do you think about <laughs> this yeah i think it's nonsense um <laughs> <laughs> i mean like uh again i think it's a little bit more uh it could be a little bit more complex here in malaysia especially you know with the asian sort of culture and um you know, it's it's not just Asian. It's it's, I don't know. It's 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 not not to sort of um, pinpoint on certain things. I think it's just like to blend on just our culture, our society. Um, you know, sometimes a bit of religion, all these things. It just we're just quite a judgmental, I think, community. If I'm gonna just put it out there, um, don't shoot me. Um, but I just I I do I have seen because I've been ex corporate before, and I have seen that trend um, where. You know, women felt that they had to suit up in that way um, with pants uh, just to be able to blend in with the sort of boys club um, mm -hmm. more and be taken a little bit more seriously. I don't necessarily think that, you know, just because a woman wears, um, you know, a, a one piece dress or a skirt or whatever it is, it makes her more feminine. I think women can be still feminine, um, uh, you know, in a pantsuit. But obviously, I feel like the great thing about women is we can have both feminine, you know, both the masculine side and, and the feminine side. Um, I mean, I personally, uh, you know, it was always about what I felt most comfortable with. And when I feel comfortable, then I feel confident. And uh, I feel that it was how I spoke, how I carried myself that spoke more volumes than what I wore. Um, but side note to those, sort of a side story. I mean, here, you know, if you go into any government house, you of course have to uh, respect um, you know, the place that you're going into so you must ensure that you're more or less covered right I, I, I did go into a, a government uh, office one time I mean I had a lot of government clients and and I don't know why this one particular time I, I actually wore a suit obviously out of respect I had a jacket uh, a top like this a t-shirt and I had long pants but I was stopped by a female at the reception and I couldn't go in when I had a meeting pending she dismissed me and said, because my pants are too tight. So, I mean, that was sort of taken at another level. I ended up having my meeting outside, but uh, even <gasps> the guy, I was meeting with a man and even he was just shocked that I was turned away because of that. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're talking about pantsuits here and then there goes another level. It could be like, oh, if that, that, those pants are too tight, you know, people could judge that as well. So, yeah, um, I mean, it's just a bit, uh, it's a bit unfortunate, I think, just generally, it's, it's a lot quicker to judge based on what people wear. But I think it's more important to hear what she has to say. Mm -hmm. And I believe a lot more in terms of, you know, what she has to say rather than what she wears. 
Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's important more what she has to say than what she wears. What about for you, Juanita? Yeah, I had the same thought exactly. I had the same thought exactly. Like it's more important to listen to um, what a woman has to say. Well, I think it's the women used to get arrested for wearing pantsuits in the 19, before 1950s. <laughs> I think if like we're celebrating that, then it's great. But um, I, I, I read another research that said uh, women in pants and makeup and jewelry and heels uh, are perceived more competent than women in skirts uh, without makeup, without jewelry, without uh, heels, which is annoying on a whole other level that we are expected to look a certain way, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that I think it all goes back to conditioning, I feel, yeah, personally, that, that we need to undo that conditioning, not be so judgmental, you know. And uh, I think it just re it requires us to to break the pattern maybe a little bit more, you know, like wear a skirt if you feel powerful in a skirt, wear pants if you feel powerful with pants, uh, dye your hair green if you feel more powerful with green hair. Um, yeah, and I, I believe that implying that a woman is perceived more competent when she wears pants and saying it as a general statement is another construct that we shouldn't encourage, which is why I love Bonito offers clothes for all, right? Pantsuits and skirt wear yeah. like. <laughs> Yeah, like a segue there. Like, you know, when I go into my wardrobe, I don't necessarily think like I just sort of think like what feels comfortable today, like yeah. what, what do I feel like today? Because I would like to think that it doesn't really affect you know uh, the, the workshop that I'm going to teach, the, yeah. the, the combination that I'm going to moderate, right? Um, yeah. But then that also sort of leads to the next question is why have we come to the stage where an outfit determines an individual's capability? Because I think, you know, even as I say that, I also know that for, you know, for certain things, there certainly, I know if I dress a certain way, I'm going to get stuff done a little differently in terms of how I'm going to be perceived in terms of what, um, uh, what the audience is going to think and, and that's crazy so why do you think we have come to a stage where outfits determine our in the, uh, uh, determine an individual's capabilities Malise it's a tough one I don't know if I have a straight answer but as you're talking about you know what you're comfortable in and uh, you know you're talking about you know picking particular things and it might help you to get some things done I'm just thinking now with the pandemic and with work from home has that changed that because I could be on this IG live and just wearing like shorts or something or, or, or you know, my, my sleeping shorts or whatever. Obviously, we're on Zoom calls and wearing half, half the outfit. I don't, know, I don't think it affects our capabilities. If anything, we might be really comfortable, you know, we'd have find us a soft spot on our couch and be in our home clothes and still get us get just as much done. Um, so uh, I think on the flip side, it could be that with the shift in culture of working from home, uh, it could be two sides. It could be we're too comfortable in our home clothes and we kind of become a bit slower and lazy. But I think at the same time, you know, it's also been proven that during the pandemic, people can be just as productive, um, even though they are working from home. And it, 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 honestly, I don't think it's really about what they wear or what they half wear um, up here. Right? <laughs> they can still run the Zoom call, you know, like a boss and just probably be in a pair of shorts. <laughs> yeah. You probably do it better because you feel free. <laughs> yeah. I, I, absolutely. I mean, I personally, like, I, if I'm feeling too tight in something, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I find it a bit harder to, like, me personally, yeah. like, perform, <laughs> properly perform um, or breathe or something. Um, but to each own, right? I think at the end of the day, it, what empowers the individual um, be it, you know, if you are empowered and, and everyone has a different sense of style. I don't think that, you know, there's a particular type of outfit that, that exudes a certain or, or ignites a certain capability. Um, someone could do really well in like sweatpants and a, and a cool t-shirt, right? And that's just their style versus someone who could do awesome and like, you know, think I'm, I'm thinking like Jessica from, from uh, Suits and she had like amazing outfits, right? And, and she yeah. just ran Awesome. She had awesome dresses, right? And, and so that's like the opposite end of the spectrum, but still, you know, they could be just as productive. So to each own. 
Yeah. yeah, to each their own, that everybody has different, to, to every has different comfort levels. I certainly, yeah. like, after every live, after every workshop, the first thing I do is take out my bra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Freedom. Freedom. And if I can, I'm like, trying to get away with wearing, like, a sports bra underneath. <laughs> yeah. What about for you, Juanita? All this is good for our mental health, you know. Like, taking off a bra, sure, taking our pants off. off as soon as we can. <laughs> Sounds love, exactly. Um, I, I'd say it it determines the maybe perception of an indi- individual's capabilities, but it shouldn't be. But I think it's still an issue because we, we don't ignore it and sometimes we maybe adhere to it. So I think if we, we ignore it, then things will slowly, you know, change. I think... Gen Z's are changing this and I love them for this, right? They're forcing us to accept them as they are. And, sure. and I think it's the only way to, it's the only way to be uh, for perceptions to change. Um, yeah, but thankfully it hasn't been an issue for me now. Um, I have been told to wear makeup to work, which is, which is really annoying because <laughs> <laughs> we wake up super early, okay? We have to like, be at work by 5.30 in the morning and I have to wake up at by four to get ready, do my hair, like be all done up and then drive to work. And, and I did a stand-up comedy uh, bit on this because it's like in walks in a man who doesn't have to do anything, who is not, you yeah. know, is not asked to do anything. He doesn't have to have to like comb his hair. But, but on days that I don't, uh, I'm not treated any differently. On days that I just don't feel like it I'm still not mm. treated any differently mm. and I still perform you know the same it's only I I only have to take You're it to radio. <laughs> I'm on radio exactly <laughs> like what why do I have to <laughs> look good for <laughs> but yeah it, it, I take into account how I feel though like sometimes I do feel mm. better with a bit of makeup on sometimes I do feel better in you know a little bit more dressed up if I wear a coat or wear like a like a cool outfit, then I feel better. And, and I do consider that that's important to me. But yeah. I, yeah, like, <laughs> I'm still laughing over you having to dress up to be on radio. Um, uh. but it, and it'd be interesting <laughs> to see, you know, like, how that, but then at the same time, you also say that, you know, people don't treat you any differently, whether you wear makeup, or whether you don't wear makeup. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and I like, how you ended it this idea of a lot of times you know it's, it's how I feel right at the end of the day it's you know I put on stuff that makes me feel good and, and I was more uh, so I'm so happy to put this on today um, and then my daughter goes mama you look so nice and and I think there's a certain pride in the way that you wear what you wear in certain places and I think it's it's important to then think about what do I want this to mean Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm going to end this, you know, sort of live on on two really important questions that's really personal to me um, and, and our life. Um, and so I have a daughter and she is homeschooled and my husband is her teacher. So my husband's job official title, right, is he's a stay at home dad. There's other lots of other beautiful things that he does. But officially, his job title is he's um, he's unschooling dad. So he he is a stay at home dad, and I'm the child and family development specialist. Like Valise, like I could resonate so much with your story, but I can't tell you the amount of times where he'll say I'm a stay at home dad, and then the people will wait for him to like. And what else? You know, you can't. I mean, what do, what do you mean? Like, or or the times where he's had to. There's been times where, you know, so with homeschoolers, you hang out, right? But he has to explain himself because he's a guy. And so there's certain, like, trips that he's not allowed to take because it's only women. Only if the mom comes, then you can take my child. But if the mom doesn't come, then you can't take my child. Which, Mm -hmm. at times, it feels so unfair because if you've ever met him, you know, he's one of the nicest, gentlest. I would, I'm like... You want him to take your child more than you want me to take your child, right? <laughs> but I'm the specialist. Um, uh, which then makes you think, like, I wonder why that is. Like, why is it frowned upon for men to be in certain industries, whether it's childcare, whether it is um, uh, being 
being a teacher, being a dad or nurse, a nurse. Um, like it's okay if the guy is a doctor, but it's not okay if the guy is a nurse. Um, mm. Why do you think that is, Mali? So what was it like growing up that way? Because you said it was the same. Your dad was at home with you and your mom when it was a breadwinner. What did it look like for you? Yeah, I mean, like, I think what I was exposed to was sort of this, this, I guess you could almost say like a sense of discrimination on both genders, as perhaps what I saw on TV a lot growing up at the time. And I think, you know, TV and the media has portrayed so much of the stuff and we lean so much on what we saw on TV, especially our generation when we had no social media. Um, and so in a way we started to believe a lot of these, um, these biases, I suppose, as we grew older. Um, so I was aware of this and just generally what I saw on TV, um, you know, with my dad, I mean, he was working, but it's just that he was working for himself. So, so self-employed in that way. But I honestly, again, it, it, it was a bit strange. Like, even though mom went out to work a lot, but it never felt that I saw her less. I still felt like we spent, I spent the same amount of time as dad because when mom was home, she was present. She'd be cooking all the time. Um, uh, yeah, I was quite, quite equal. Um, and when my dad used to make me my morning, you know, you take your lunchbox to school. It was my dad that would actually make them for us. And he'd actually write little like uh, love notes every day, like a little wish for school. Oh. And put it in so and I started now doing this So me and my husband now both of us start doing this for uh, my daughter now that she's starting her kindergarten so I mean uh, this is yeah this is a bit of a tricky one because I just I feel that it's it's both men and women are being discriminated mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I mean I know a lot of our talk has been very much focused on women and, and, and the gap for women but I think just as much men are facing this and why not? Why can't men be a stay-at-home dad? I think my husband would love to be a stay-at-home dad if there's an opportunity to. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it, it, we shouldn't be judged just based on that we have different body parts. I think you know, at the end of the day, we're still human, and uh, we we still able to serve similar capabilities. Uh, you know, if we wish wish to do so. So, it's. I find it. Yeah, it's still there, and I think it's still a little sad. And um, but at the same time, I can start to I can see that there has been a little bit of a shift. I mean, obviously not significantly, but I just hope that you know both men, women, or you know younger young boys and girls as they graduate and going to the workforce are um, finding that courage to really follow what they want to do and shouldn't make the decision or influence the decision based on what they think others or how others may perceive them, or what, you know, certain people may expect of them. Um, and I think, Juanita, you did point out that with this Gen Z, um, I think they're going to be changing uh, the way things will be moving forward. And and I hope that they pave the right path so that, you know, for our children, right, Rachel, are there, what, Gen Alpha or something like that? You know, when, when they go into the workforce, I mean, this is going to be a non-issue. So for me, if my son, you know, decides, like, I spoke to my husband about this, what if Asher wants to do... I don't know, dance class or ballet or something, right? Do you think there's going to be an issue? Or if Alea wants to do um, martial arts or whatever it is, right? And my husband's like, absolutely no. Um, and so again, I feel like it does start with us at home, I think right now, um, us as, as parents. And uh, and again, with these Gen Zs, they're definitely um, challenging, uh, I guess, the, the status quo and hopefully paving the way for, for future generations. Um, so I don't really have a, a direct answer to this. I just think it, it's still there, especially in our generation, you know, 30s, 40s, and um, I don't even know what we are. What are we in the middle? Millennials. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's still it's, it's sad to see, but I just hope that people do find the courage to really just do what they believe that they want to do. Yeah. yeah, I like what you said about how it, it's both sides. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, because I'm also thinking at the same time of the stay-at-home dad, like, but then a lot of times I also feel so much pressure as a mom. Like, what are you doing as a mom? Why are you not, you know, why are you not doing enough? And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm like, because I'm working, but, mm -hmm. but I'm still expected to, you know, if my, if my husband makes dinner, everybody's, oh, oh, like, oh, so cute. And I make dinner, everyone's like, yeah, you're expected to make dinner. Yeah. Why, why, why are the <laughs> What's that? veggies? How dare you not make it like a beautiful bento box, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that is both sides. What about for you, Juanita? What do you think 
in terms of um, why it's frowned upon for certain men to be in certain industries. Honestly, I had I had no idea that um, men had that issue of of like you know being stigmatized for being stay at home dads. Like when you when you talked about um, excursions, right, school excursions and outings, yeah. and then how he couldn't go. That's unfair. But I, actually, before I ask, I wanted to ask you about the conversation that you like. What do you do when this happens? Do you? Yeah. I think for me, like my heart was broken because it was the other mom had messaged me and she messaged me with respect, right? With yeah. kindness. And so they, what had happened was the kids were going to go on a play date. And usually um, my husband does schooling with her in the morning. And so I usually have other work stuff that I do. And so he takes her on like they'll go, they, they do unschooling, so they'll go to a museum and then they explore and expand and whatever that they're learning. And so they had invited this other friend to join them. Um, but the mom realized that as soon as she realized it was just going to be dad and that I wasn't going to be there, she sent me a message and she said, I am so, so sorry. I hope you understand. But our rule in our house is that we don't allow our daughter to be with other men. Um, by themselves, which I thought at the same time, okay, you know, and so she said, I really struggled with this message. And I, I had so much empathy, because I mean, that's a hard message to write. So she's like, I don't think your husband's a bad person. I don't think like, I don't think your husband would ever hurt my child. But that's a rule yeah. that we have as for our family that our kids cannot be alone with other men by themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as a right. mom, you emphasize and you, and, and I respect that that's a boundary, but at the same time, I was heartbroken for my husband because, you know, mm. he, you know, he, I think he just, while he understands, I think he was also hurt by it. And so it was needing to sort of explain it to my child because there's also two little kids in this who don't quite understand why we can go hang out with um, Mr. Joe, yeah. Uncle Joe, um, when Miss Rachel is there, but we can't go out hang out with Uncle Joe if Miss Rachel's not there. Because who's to say that Miss Rachel will not abuse the kids? Who's to say mm -hmm. that the women isn't going to abuse? And so the really complex mm -hmm. issues and how yeah. we left it with the kids is, you know, coming back to, <laughs> as a specialist, this is what you say, you say, what do you think and how does it make you feel? Um, and so that's how we left it with the children and, and we made space like so with me and my husband we made space to like talk about our feelings and why and I think if anything it made us even more sort of um, determined to teach our child like that we look at people we look at who they are and, and we, we listen to our bodies and how that makes us feel more than just blanket rule of we don't hang up with these kind of people. We don't, because I think that's where a lot of these like prejudices start, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. to sort of like wrap that up, this last weekend, um, my my daughter's best friend is a little boy, and she it was just her birthday, and she just got a nail polish set, and these two little seven year olds painting their nails, um, so happy, it's glittery, and then the dads came and joined them to get their nails painted. And I thought, like, this is powerful. This is a powerful mm -hmm. moment. This is a statement that when we can say, and so I said, how does it make you feel? And they said, uh, I said, you know, because they were then going to go out and they knew they were going to get teased. And I said, how does it make you feel? And then Uncle Joe told them how it made me feel. I, it makes me so happy that Ella Grace painted my nails. So every time I look at it, I just think, I, my heart just gets so happy, right? And it was, it was a very gentle sort of explanation, but it was truthful. So, yeah. I don't know. I don't that's know if that helps. Nice. Does that help? Yes, Anita? that's beautiful. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's so nice to hear. It's like, oh my God, I love your life. So many beautiful <laughs> moments. <laughs> but I think, I think, um, well, I, uh, we, there's this issue, I think, that, that, um, you know, men in certain industries because we don't, there's just not enough acceptance, like, mm -hmm. you know, like you've shown in, in your life, in your personal life. And I think it's difficult, right? Because everybody has boundaries, but 
it with I, I think when it comes to stigmas towards men, it's also um, work as as women to to open up. I think and to allow allow for for men to be vulnerable, allow for men to to express themselves. I think a lot of us we um, like come back to like personal relationships, right? A lot of us want a guy who is sensitive. Um, a guy who you know has, knows how to talk about his feelings, who takes care of our feelings. But then when it when it comes down to it, when we actually see a guy cry, a lot of us go like, "Oh my god, and man up," you know. So it, it's sort of like, right? I, I, right. I, yeah. yeah, man so, up, the balls, you know, all these like sort of euphemisms and stuff. Yeah, men don't cry. So I think it's it's a lot of that conversation that we have to have with with men and with other women as well to, to change the stigma um, yeah, I, and to encourage it. That, yeah. I love that you, you, you said that because I think it's, it's that. It's that we have to have this conversation not just with other men but also with other women. I have a question here um, and it says, what is some advice you would give to women who might be held back or hesitant to pursue their dreams due to existing or potential gender discrimination and prejudices? Oh, that's a good one. I, well, I mean, off the top of my head, um, thanks for the question, it really makes you think. Um, but also it's the reality that uh, a lot of uh, women are probably facing this and probably feeling alone a lot of the time. Um, so if, you know, they have the opportunity and, and can find a little bit of courage, um, I'm all for just talking to someone, um, someone trusted, uh, someone you love, or even if it's not a family or friend, you know, some, some people are just in unfortunate circumstances where they are actually quite alone and they just don't feel like there's anyone in their circle to talk to. Um, then, you know, seek someone perhaps who's unbiased or even um, a professional. I think that speaking to some, when you're speaking out about it, I think what happens is you kind of start to disown it perhaps. I think you're almost kind of spitting it out in a way and talking about it out loud, um, I think can help someone to start going through the process of also figuring out you know, sort of a new path or a solution, or, or again, um, it, it's quite a, a, I can't read the rest of the question, maybe a general situation, but I mean, I, I do truly believe that no one is ever really alone um, and and to talk about it, find someone to, to talk about it as a first step. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about yeah. for you, Juanita? Do you have any advice you would give to, so the rest of the question says, um, to give to a woman who might be held back or hesitant to pursue their dreams due to existing or potential gender discrimination and prejudices. Mm-hmm. Um, I I agree with Melise that it's going to feel very lonely. I'd say talk to the people who you feel are holding you back um, and tell them that this is how you feel. I, I'm For me, it I felt, even though my parents are very, very encouraging and, and they, you know, they always say, like, you can do whatever you want. But it was a conversation for me that I had to have with my parents to, mm. to tell them this is how I feel. Um, even though the response, we can't expect, right? Like, we may expect them to respond a certain way and then they, if they respond negatively, that can impact us more. But... I think having that conversation, like we said, having that conversation and uh, and releasing that for me, it lifted a lot of weight off my shoulders, a lot of burden for me, because it, it's like they don't know, right? They don't know what I'm going through. So in being truthful and honest about it, really, really helped my progress and really helped me take steps into achieving this dream. And I think in, in pursuing your your dreams and, and the future plans that you have, it's like, it feels like such a long shot, right? It feels like, oh, it's so far away. But I think it's important to to list down like little steps that you can take, even if it's like 
I don't know, buying a new mouse <laughs> for this new <laughs> career that you want to pursue, right? Like setting up your home office, even if it's as small as buying a mouse, that's something that you can do for yourself. And I think these little things um, will build up inside of you mm-hmm. and it will, it will help you be more courageous, I think, into facing, um, into pursuing whatever you want to do. Because eventually you have to, you have to pursue your dreams and you have to pursue whatever you feel like you want to. Otherwise, you're just going to feel like you're at a loss if you don't do it. So you need to go out and you need to do it. Just, yeah, just take little steps um, in, I mean, I in can, that process. I hope that helps. I could just yeah, sort of share ahead, yeah. uh, myself, um, maybe what I faced uh, in my first career. I was with my first company for eight years um, after graduating. So coming in, young, naive, um, and it was very much um, white males at the top, especially in Asia. It was white guys basically running all our Asian offices. And for me, it was like, you know, A, it should be an Asian, and B, where are all the females? Um, And there were like no female mentors I could turn to because, and so I didn't know, how how do I become a managing director of Malaysia? And I I don't know how to, I don't, I didn't have a mentor, I guess, in that that sense. So, I guess from just, just sharing my own experience, uh, two things. First thing is uh, I had to find that courage and that voice. I did actually speak to my male managers at the time and really ask them, it was very clear, this is what I want to achieve in my career. You know, can you guide me on how I can get there? Uh, whether or not they would be supportive or laugh in my face or whatever it is, then that's on them, right? I mean, I was just lucky that I had male managers that were willing to, 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 to sort of carve out what would be expected um, of me. Um, but the thing is, is that had I had not stepped up or spoken up about it, they actually don't even know if that's what I want. And they would just, you know, allow me to happily sit at the level I, w- I would be and not push me um, to pursue a certain level. Um, so again, like, you know, if you're trying to rise to the top or whatever it is you want to achieve, a lot of people have a lot of assumptions. And so it's just ensuring that we're clarifying that by, by speaking up about it. And then second thing that I did in order to achieve my goal. So my goal was, how can I launch our office in Malaysia and become a managing director in Malaysia? And I achieved that in 18 months. Um, so the second thing Ooh. that I did was find my tribe. So finding a tribe that will support me through that, through the good times and the bad times, because yeah, it, it's a lonely journey. It's tough. You have to work hard, whatever it is. And I did manage to find my tribe within the company, um, women uh, who um, were around the region. So we had Skype back then, and uh, we were all had had similar-ish goals as well. So we're all rallying and supporting one another, um, and uh, of course a couple of male colleagues as well. So I think finding that tribe had really helped to be less of a lonely journey to kind of get to where you want to be. So that was just um, my my personal uh, journey. I love that. I love this, like. It sounds like it's in partnership, one, like that Juanita said, you know, that you start small, even no matter how small, you have to start somewhere and you start small and then that's how you build up, that's how you scaffold up. And then following up with you, Malise, that you have to speak up, you know, part of the small is that you have to speak up and you speak into it and you have to say, this is what I want to do, because they might not know. I think Mm. very often we talk about the spotlight effect and you think everybody knows, everybody's looking at you, but really everybody thinks the same thing. Everybody's working on their stuff. And so you have to speak out. But I love how you ended with this idea of we have to have a tribe. And and I think certainly it's, it's, you have to have people that cheer you on when you're down, but you also have to have those people that like celebrate with you. And I think mm. that's part of the reason why um, having these conversations have been so powerful because it allows us to, you know, find like-minded people. Um, mm. and, and I think not only like-minded people, but also very diverse people to then listen in on different opinions and, and I think also expand what we know. I also have this other question from Samantha too, which I thought was a really nice um, uh, follow up to it. And she said, as a woman who works in male dominated, oh, it's a bit long. As a woman who works in a male dominated sector and potentially faces prejudice, would you prioritize your passion for the work that you do or the work culture environment in your office? because both tend to be 
huge deciding factors and considerations for job choice. So I think what she's trying to say is that would you choose, would you prioritize your passion for the work that you do, or do you choose um, a job based on uh, uh, the work culture and environment of your office? What do you think, Juanita? That's a tough one because it goes hand in hand, right? Passion, passion or passion the culture, or the culture of the culture and work environment of the office. Um, I I would start with passion for the work, um, because that's I think that's that's the most important when you how you feel. And, and how motivated you are for the job that you have. Um, but culture also has, a, I think, a, a big part to play in longevity. So I'm just going to, I hope this helps, Samantha, but I'm going to talk about my personal experience working in a male-dominated sector. Uh, when I started producing, I was the first female producer, and it was my first job. Um, and it was very male-dominated. All of the men that I was working with were at least... 20 years older than me. So I was very young as well. And I had to, you know, take a lot of hits and comments like, oh, you're wearing a dress today. Like the Me Too thing. You're wearing a dress today. Can you stand up and give me a twirl? Um, and because, yeah, because I would come in really early in the morning, um, I, I sometimes have my hair in a bun, you know, and I just wear a sweater. And I get comments like, uh, you look like you just gave birth. So, yeah, and at the time, I had no idea how to how to fight for myself, you know, and to say, hey, that's sexist, <laughs> misogynistic, and that's, like, not okay to say. I didn't know how to fight for myself. Um, but I love the job. I love the job because it was radio, because I got to meet so many people. I got to write interviews. I got to, um, you know, meet a lot of celebrities, and that was cool, but... But at the end of the day, that culture it took away parts of parts of me, um, and it took away my spirit as well. So I think I think start with passion, but you I think usually you have like a three month probation, right, or six months. So my advice would be to go for the passion and then. Stay and wait out to see if the culture will suit you and leave before you, you get jaded. <laughs> if that, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> that's that so sense. helpful. I think it's so, it's such a, it's so easy for us to say go for passion, right? Like go for passion because that's what, so, YOLO, go for passion. I think that's <laughs> yeah. also the realistic hand in hand of go for passion but don't lose, you know, when, when you get to a point where you're really losing parts of yourself, then maybe it's time to venture somewhere else. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. What about for you, Mali? I mean, similar to what Juanita said, um, I mean, at the end of the day, a company doesn't own you and uh, you do have a choice. And, uh, you know, there, there, there could be, you could be pursuing your passion and working in a great culture in another company. And uh, I guess, you know, really look for those alternatives. And... Yes. Um, you know what, it would be, if you decide to leave the company, it will be their loss, really. So mm -hmm. um, I think that, I mean, and this is probably a bit outlandish of me to say, um, but we should be less afraid of wanting to leave a workplace if we're not happy with an environment after a while. And um, and it's within your right to as well. And uh, And I don't think there's anything wrong with that if you're looking for you know, shifting, you, you could still pursue the role or the, the job or the industry that you're in, but it could be just with a different company. I think working culture has now, especially now at Gen Z's, when, when I, every time I do an interview, they always ask me, what is working culture like? It's like standard question I get from a Gen Z. Um, and it's just so important to people. And uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it's a tough one, to, if you, you know, but I don't believe that you have to choose one or the other. It's, it's trying to see, is there another opportunity where you can have both? Because they're, they're both important um, in terms of you loving doing what you're doing. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. I, I like what you said because, you know, right before I got into this conversation, my uh, manager and I had sort of a disagreement about something. And I was sort of saying, you know, this is my 
this is my boundary, this is what I believe in. Um, and she had said, no, da, 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 da. And then this was a few weeks, a few days ago. And then um, I sort of followed up on that conversation today. And she said, you know, I sat on it and realized it was really more of like stuff that I was doing. Da, da, da. And, and we ended this conversation by saying, hey, thank you so much for sharing your thought process. I really appreciate that because I am learning just like you, Anita, I'm learning to, to speak up for my boundaries. And it was scary for me to be able to say, to go against my manager who, you know, manages me and has very, like, that's why she's my manager, guys, because she's able to force me to do things that I would normally not do, right? And so I said, thank you so much for explaining it for me because I am learning how to speak up myself and that still scares me. But having the right culture in the right company who then values when you speak up, even though it was a disagreement, mm. even though it, I wanted A and she wanted B. And we were, we were like, Rah! we both had to walk away from this conversation. Like, we're going to pick this up again in a few days. And so, and then after that, that conversation, the repair that happened after that, was so powerful and I think it's because of the culture. So I love what you said, Marlies, this idea of like, hey, you don't have to stay there. They are other companies because I didn't always have that experience. I've, I've not, I mean, just like Juanita, I've had to have like really bad managers, really bad jobs, really terrible people that would make me do things that I did not want to do and then have to sit with that feeling of like, why did I agree to that? I hate everything about this. So thank you for sharing your viewpoints. Um, um, I think just to end, do you have any last words for our audience? Because I'm conscious about time too. Um, we'll start with you, Juanita. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for watching and thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, I, I'd say because our topic is gender equality, I'd, I'd say just, you know, try to try to have this conversation every day. Um, in in small ways in your workplace with your colleagues with your bosses uh, always check in with yourself don't forget to check in with yourself as to what you want what you're comfortable with are you okay with what's going on what would you prefer and always uh, yeah always check in first and then you know and and then please tell somebody about it. <laughs> tell somebody if you're not happy with something. Tell somebody if you're, you know, you feel like you're being wronged wherever you are. Um, and yeah, just, just keep, keep fighting in little ways every day. It does make a big difference, I believe. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Juanita. What about for you, Marlies? Any last words for our audience? Yeah, I love what you said, Juanita, about checking in with ourselves. I think sometimes we get caught up about everything else in the world and we forget to check in with ourselves like mentally emotionally as well so uh, definitely uh, second um, what Juanita is saying there um, and also I think you know as we you know this this topic of gender equality kind of comes up probably every year around this time of the year and it's an ongoing battle it's an ongoing challenge um, and it's really about walking the talk um, and a, a lot of the change can just start with us. I think if every person just took a little bit of effort or was just a little bit more conscious about the biases around them and how they could, you know, impact change or enable change or, or be the change, because honestly, a lot of the times we're all biased and there's, a, there's basically like 500 different biases out there. Um, but especially specifically with gender, you know, gender biases, there's a lot of subsets of gender bias that fall under gender biases. But you know, if it could start with us, um, you know, how, uh, you know, we are, how we, um, maybe how we treat others as well, how, if we're parents, you know, for those who are parents, how we, um, our role model to our children, both our sons and our daughters, and equally our partner as well has to be on the same page as well. I think if we can start to, to take, um, you know, just our own very first step and, and making the effort as individuals, hopefully we will lead into a world where it's, you know, more gender equal and, and kind of really see it from the eyes of our children. So, I mean, like my daughter, you know, because she's a bit older than my son, really sees mommy and daddy as equal. And the other day she, she drew, she had a canvas painting of a rainbow 
and outdoors and everything. And, and mommy and daddy were under this rainbow and she was trying to explain this picture to her. It was just like, it was a happy equal, like in a way, in her own words, like a happy equal world when mommy and daddy was there. And, and so it's like, how can we, you know, work towards building a world um, the way our children see it? Uh, well, I guess from a children's perspective, right? There's no biases, uh, you know, with a five-year-old um, between men, men and women. So hopefully we work towards a world where that actually becomes true. Yeah. Oh, so powerful. Thank you, Millie, for, for sharing that. And I think like all the moms in this room, just like, oh, and, <laughs> and, and I think, I think I want to continue to encourage you guys to do that for everybody that's listening. Um, if you want to continue this conversation, just like Juanita said, just like Millie said, um, Love Bonito has given us this amazing resource. Uh, someone's going to put it on the link right now. And what you can do is it's this beautiful deck of conversation cards. And there's just little prompts for you to be able to do with your friend or do with somebody else that you love. And, 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 and it really sort of allows um, people to think open your mind up to different um, opinions um, and so all you do is you pick a card and then you go deep you get empowered you break the bias and you start talking about the topics that matter to you and mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really what it is it's, we need to have conversations uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations um, we need to be able to use our voices and speak out mm. no matter, even if it's a whisper. And, and I think we really need to sort of make the time to do that. So if you want to, it is on um, the Love Bonito site. And then once again, on behalf of Love Bonito, I want to thank our amazing panelists. Thank you for spending the night with me. And thank you to our audience who has been here, all the hearts. We appreciate mm. you. Um, and we'll see you again. Bye guys. You Thank you so much. Do you to take a photo or something? Photo? I'm not sure. Sure. I'll take it. One, two, okay. three. Bye. Because we're all wearing the same thing, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Bye, much. Everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.